Jill, whenever you're ready. All right, thank you, Christina. Thank you all for standing by. And welcome to our webinar entitled Lake Erie Algae in the Depth of Winter. This is a brand new webinar series called Freshwater Science that will highlight Ohio Sea Grant and partnering scientists every month. Every quarter is a different focus from human health and fish farming to harmful algal blooms and human decision making bringing applied research to the public on issues that affect our Lake Erie communities. I am Jill Gentis Brednicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Lab, and joining me today is Dr. Mike McKay from the University of Windsor. Dr. McKay serves as the Executive Director of the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research and Professor in the School of Environment at the University of Windsor. Dr. McKay's research is focused on large lakes where he studies the biogeochemical cycling of nutrients, harmful algal blooms, and winter limnology. He is the author of over 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts and serves as an investigator on grants from the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, the U.S. National Science Foundation, and the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. We're delighted to have Dr. McKay here to talk about his algae research. A few logistical things I wanted to mention about uh, the webinars. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Around um, 1220, we'll, I'll conduct a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to pull up the chat feature anytime during his talk, and I will collect and pose your questions out to Dr. McKay at the end of his presentation. As a reminder, this webinar has auto captioning and is being recorded to be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the half an hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill that survey out. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mike McKay from the University of Windsor, who will present Lake Erie Algae in the Depth of Winter. Dr. McKay. Thank you, Jill. And it's uh, uh, so nice joining you today. Uh, Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Lab uh, have been very influential in, in my own career uh, while I was working in, in Ohio uh, at, at Bowling Green State University. Uh, received a, a lot of support uh, through Ohio Sea Grant and uh, much of the winter work uh, that, that we've been able to do over the past uh, decade or so uh, is due to some of the support that Ohio Sea Grant has provided. So you can see my uh, seminar, the, the view is fine? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, great. And I'm just going to switch off uh, my camera uh, uh, during the actual presentation. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, you know, as Jill mentioned, I'm, I'm going to share with you some insights from our work uh, uh, on, on winter in, in, in Lake Erie. And it's always nice uh, on, on warm summer days to be thinking a little bit about, about winter. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing, you know, the, the, the different seasonality we find uh, within the Great Lakes and these, these, uh, uh, these extremes uh, that, that we experience in, uh, in Lake Erie uh, Basin. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, Ohio Sea Grant has been an important supporter of, of our research, a number of other uh, uh, funding agencies, uh, as well as uh, in-kind support uh, from, from uh, uh, both federal, uh, state, uh, and, and provincial agencies in the U.S. and Canada have been influential in, in uh, uh, supporting this research. Okay, so when we think of algal blooms in Lake Erie, this is generally what comes to mind. Uh, and although we are mainly reminded of the occurrence during summer, it's important to remember uh, that the algae themselves are year-round residents of the water bodies that they inhabit. But very little is known about other times in the annual cycle of blooms, or for that matter, much about what goes on in the lake outside of the open water seasons. Winter especially serves as a seasonal blind spot to our understanding of the lake ecosystem. In part, this may be predicated by a general belief that the lake is not very active during the winter, but the reality is that ice cover and extreme weather conditions in winter and spring uh, prevent regular monitoring and, and safe sampling. Not to say that there haven't been efforts in the past, and given that this is an Ohio Sea Grant Stone Lab seminar series, I'd be uh, remiss in not mentioning the early efforts of, of David Chandler, uh, who spent uh, much of the early part of his career uh, at Ohio State and working at Stone Lab. And uh, arguably, uh, the most comprehensive study to winter limnology in the Laurentian Great Lakes to date is that by Chandler, who coordinated a five-year study 
uh, in the late 1930s and early 1940s, during which she observed pulses of diatoms in midwinter under the ice in the western basin of Lake Erie, uh, low zooplankton biomass, and, and a variable light environment. Since the seminal work of Chandler, several monitoring efforts have contributed important insights into winter conditions in Lake Erie. In general, uh, they've shown a high degree of variability in biological and chemical properties, uh, but they uh, require the consistency and scope of, of sampling effort to link this variability to ice cover, a dominant and consistent feature uh, in Lake Erie uh, uh, during winter. The the urgency to establish winter surveillance programs really comes from uh, the, the rapidly changing climate that we're experiencing. And uh, nowhere is this manifest manifested more as in, in, in the uh, declining ice cover in the Great Lakes, which really parallels what we're finding uh, in, in the Arctic. Uh, so over the past half, uh, uh, half century, We've seen a roughly 70 to 75% decline in ice cover over the Great Lakes in general. And that's uh, shown here uh, from an article by, uh, by Jia Wang in, 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 in 2012. When we look at Lake Erie, uh, the absolute decline in ice cover may not be as high as the Great Lakes in general, uh, but it's characterized by a lot of variability. And we seem to be seeing more what I would characterize as, as low ice years. And for those of you who've been working in the Great Lakes uh, uh, Basin for the last decade or two, you might, might recall some of these extreme low ice years. Uh, uh, 2012 was, was the first year that, that we were working in winter in the Great Lakes, Lakes and experienced almost no ice cover in, in Lake Erie. Uh, and another recent one was, was 2020, uh, uh, you know, as, as the pandemic was, was uh, getting off the ground uh, in, in North America. That was another year of very low ice cover uh, in, in Lake Erie. So in the face of a rapidly changing climate, it's important that we establish baselines uh, so we can better understand changes in the ecosystem in response to this, this uh, uh, rapidly changing or, or loss of ice cover. So one approach to uh, uh, filling these gaps and establishing some, some monitoring programs in the Great Lakes is uh, uh, through partnership with our joint Coast Guards. So far from uh, uh, the, the lakes being, being quiet uh, during the winter, uh, both the US and, and Canadian Coast Guards operate, uh, uh, cooperate in a program called Operation Coal Shovel uh, in aid of flow of commerce uh, through the lakes. So essentially breaking ice uh, to allow uh, 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 Lakers to continue uh, uh, transporting goods and, 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 and materials uh, between ports, and especially in the, in the lower lakes. And we've been working uh, with both the U.S. and Canadian Coast Guard since 2007. Uh, so 2007, we, we were provided an opportunity, and, and uh, this was a, a group of scientists I've been working with for, for many years in the Great Lakes, uh, uh, George Bulbergeon of Bowling Green State University, Steve Wilhelm, University of Tennessee, uh, Michael Twiss, uh, 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 currently at, at Clarkson University, uh, Hunter, Herrick, uh, Hunter Carrick uh, uh, from Central Michigan University also uh, participated in some of these, these early efforts. And uh, we were able to join a, initially in 2007, a Canadian Coast Guard uh, survey through Lake Erie uh, lasting four days. And uh, since that time, we've been able to partner also with the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, primarily with uh, Coast Guard Cutter uh, Nia Bay. And that program was, was initiated uh, through the efforts of, of was currently Captain uh, Bill Watira. At that time, he was uh, Lieutenant Commander Bill Watira, uh, Commanding Officer of, of Nia Bay. Uh, Bill uh, has a, a master's degree in oceanography and uh, was very interested in, in uh, participating in scientific efforts uh, during his command of, of the vessel. And you can see the engagement here. Uh, this is a, uh, an example where, where uh, the ship uh, was conducting safety training in the ice in Lake Erie. And while uh, uh, some of the crew members were being uh, tossed into the lake for, for survival training, uh, Bill took equipment that we left with, with Nia Bay and was measuring light penetration under the ice in, in the lake. And uh, we've also, uh, you know, coordinated a program with Nia Bay, an educational program where, whereby we, we've offered through Bowling Green State University uh, a, a gen ed college credit uh, to members of, of the crew 
provide instructional training on board through uh, a combination of myself and, and the commanding officer. And then the uh, laboratory component would be uh, sample collection processing and, 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 and data analysis and interpretation. And in some of those efforts, we've actually even set up a, a, a small laboratory in the ship's office uh, so that they can actually uh, uh, collect samples, pro process samples while the vessel is, is underway. And you can see uh, uh, the you know what these efforts can yield in terms of of, of coverage, uh, both spatial and, and temporal, uh, through our coordination with with Coast Guard efforts. This is just one one year showing uh, uh, ship navigation tracks uh, throughout Lake Erie during the winter, and then in red uh, showing sampling stations. Now, because of the um, general mission of of most Coast Guard cutters, and again, aid of transport. Uh, a lot of those navigate, a lot of those sample tracks uh, are shown basically in a transect between Detroit and the mouth of the, of, uh, between Cleveland and the mouth of the Detroit River, uh, which reflects uh, uh, Nia Bay's typical action breaking ice uh, uh, in that in that path. Uh, Nia Bay also does a lot of ice breaking in in the St. Clair rivers and Detroit rivers in in uh, uh, to to mitigate flood uh, uh, damage during during winter. Um, so although the spatial resolution of sampling in that arrangement may not be great, uh, it does provide good temporal resolution with sampling conducted uh, essentially from, from November, December uh, through to March, April. And again, these are times when we do not see the uh, uh, monitoring occurring through uh, most of the agencies, uh, state, federal, provincial that, that typically conduct monitoring in, in, in Lake Erie. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of the type of sampling that goes on, uh, we run plankton nets over the side of the vessels. We, we run uh, uh, Niskin bottles uh, over the side to collect samples at, at discrete depths. Uh, we've run uh, uh, sediment traps uh, under the ice to collect uh, biomass that's exported uh, uh, at, at various points uh, uh, seasonally in, in Lake Erie. And when we first joined uh, one of the Coast Guard vessels in 2007. We didn't have expectations uh, to, to see a whole lot in terms of, of biological activity. Uh, breaking through the ice on that first trip, this is the type of image that we, we came across, especially in, 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 in the central basin of the lake. Uh, large expanses of, of brown colored water. And examining that water under a microscope it wasn't sediment, but in, instead it was uh, uh, large aggregations of, of filamentous diatom algae. Uh, so, you know, earlier on, I started the presentation, talked about blooms in Lake Erie. And again, we, I think we, we typically think of, of the blooms as cyanobacteria that are pervasive uh, during the, uh, the, the late summer in, in Lake Erie, late summer, early fall in Lake Erie. Here we have a switch to a different type of algal growth uh, associated with ice cover during the winter. And uh, these surveys have shown uh, that there's biomass in the ice, under the ice, and also in open water. Uh, you can see this uh, particularly clear when we run plankton nets over the side and, and concentrate biomass. Uh, and it's, it's like a, a thick tarry substance, uh, the concentration of, of diatoms. Uh, that that those plankton hauls yield, and we've uh, published this work in a number of outlets. This was the uh, the, the first article that that our group published, uh, describing uh, the 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 winter diatom blooms in the Lake Erie appeared in Journal of Great Lakes Research in 2012. So uh, a a brief summary of of the surveys: uh, these winter phytoplankton assemblages are dominated by diatoms. I, I didn't mention this uh, uh, yet, but but uh, analyses suggest that they're nutrient uh, sufficient assemblages. Uh, they're low light adapted, uh, based on a number of of uh, metrics that we've we've applied to them, and they appear to be physiologically robust. And it also appears that this diatom uh, burst of biomass we find in 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 winter and early spring may also be an important driver of central basin hypoxia. Uh, so, so many of you will be familiar with the, the dead zones we find in the central basin of Lake Erie. Uh, for, for many years, we're wondering what's driving uh, the formation of those dead zones. 
And uh, it would appear that that is this massive uh, 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 diatom biomass that's exported to the bottom of, of, of the central basin uh, during later in the spring uh, that may be driving uh, formational hypoxia later in the summer. Okay, I want to speak a little bit to the um, uh, the data we've generated uh, from this project uh, prior to uh, uh, moving from Ohio to my present position at University of Windsor. Uh, I had a small contract with Ohio Sea Grant uh, through the Habri uh, uh, program, uh, focused on on uh, uh, nutrient inventories uh, collected during the, during the, the the winter months, and and the idea there being that. Uh, nutrients in the lake deposited in the lake uh, from the period of March till, till June or July uh, will be indicative of later cyanobacterial growth uh, that, that year. And so data that we've collected in coordination with the Coast Guard uh, has been mainly deposited into uh, uh, the BICODEMO repository. So this is the biological and Chemical Oceanography Data Management Office repository. Uh, I became familiar with this repository uh, through uh, uh, a number of our projects that were supported through the National Science Foundation and uh, for uh, uh, through the Division of Ocean, o Ocean Sciences. Uh, they mandate that you, you uh, upload uh, your data from those supported projects to BicoDemo. So we have most of our winter data collected through, uh, uh, through uh, our, our projects in, in the winter updated to uploaded to BicoDemo. Uh, a couple of those data sets, you can see the citations here. Uh, I can make these available uh, uh, later if anyone's interested. Uh, these data sets will include uh, nutrient data. Most of our uh, nutrient data uh, at, at the time of these earlier uh, collections were actually uh, processed through, through Heidelberg University. Uh, some has actually been done at, at Stone Lab. Uh, they also include uh, uh, other physical chemical parameters of the water column, uh, ice observations. These are made by, by uh, uh, the deck uh, uh, command on, on Nia Bay in terms of, of ice concentration, thickness, type of ice. Um, and then as well, as well we also have uh, phytoplankton data uh, included here through microscopic counts. One thing that'll become clear if you look at those uh, data sets is that while it's, it's, it's it, it, while cooperation with the Coast Guards has been really important in, in, in advancing our knowledge of winter processes in, in, in Lake Erie, they really are just snapshots. Um, there are, are, are difficulties in terms of, of scheduling uh, uh, regular sampling missions. Uh, you know, this is, you know, priorities of the Coast Guard in the winter are, are uh, you know, uh, flow of commerce, so support of, 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 of commerce, uh, search and rescue, uh, and security. Uh, if they can, they will also uh, uh, support science missions. Uh, but that scheduling is, is, is sometimes, you know, challenging, uh, to, to, to say the least. And so thinking about other approaches to uh, increasing our data on winter processes, I look to a program that's been, been ongoing in the province of Ontario uh, since the late 1960s, the Drinking Water Surveillance Program or the, or the Ontario Water Intakes Program. And uh, through that program, and now they actually have data you can, up, you, you can uh, uh, download from a website, and I'm showing you a, uh, uh, a screen grab from their website right here in the website URLs below. At weekly or bi-weekly intervals uh, throughout the year, water samples are collected from these intakes uh, and chemical analysis and even, even phytoplankton analysis is, is conducted. And uh, so we have a nice long-term data set available through the province of Ontario uh, for each of the Great Lakes that Ontario bounds. Uh, for Lake Erie, uh, we have uh, five water intakes uh, that are participating in the program that stretch from uh, the mouth of the Detroit River where it flows into Lake Erie at Amherstburg uh, to uh, the where Lake Erie exits into the Niagara River at, at Rose Hill, and then in between we've got several uh, several water intakes that provide coverage of the western, central, and eastern basins. And this program has been uh, uh, important uh, in in terms of of supporting science in the past as well. And I hear I've taken a a figure from a, an article published by Ken Nichols in the late 1990s 
One of the things that winter uh, ice cover does is it can help consolidate nutrients into the sediment, especially particulate nutrients uh, in a more static water column uh, underneath ice cover provides an opportunity for these nutrients to become consolidated in the sediment. When ice cover is reduced, uh, as we're seeing consistent with uh, a change in climate with, with uh, global warming, we will see increased frequency of open waters in the winter, uh, increased physical wind-aided mixing of the water column, and it becomes more difficult to consolidate, especially particulate nutrients into the, uh, uh, into the sediment. And so what you're seeing here is um, uh, from, from the Nichols article is a, a panel on top, the Southern Oscill Oscillation Index. Uh, and then on the bottom, uh, you're seeing uh, uh, 12 month moving median concentrations of, of mean total phosphorus and filtered reactive phosphorus. And these are taken from the Lake Huron outflow. Um, uh, so Lake Huron is flowing into the St. Clair River uh, over the period 1976 to 1994. And uh, you see in the bottom uh, several cases where we have peaks of total phosphorus and, and uh, uh, filtered reactive phosphorus. And these seem to occur during strong El Nino events uh, when the Southern Oscillation Index was strongly negative over periods of several months. Uh, basically winters uh, with, with low ice cover. And uh, I think a number of you may be familiar with uh, some of the work of Don Scavia uh, in recent years, uh, looking at phosphorus uh, contributions into Lake Erie and suggesting there may be substantial phosphorus actually coming from uh, Lake Huron and through the St. Clair River uh, eventually into Lake Erie. And the idea being here that uh, under, under uh, uh, a mild winter with reduced ice cover, we have more scouring, more erosion of the coastline. Uh, you can see sediment plumes here uh, in Southern uh, Lake Huron. Notice this is 2012. This is one of our very low ice years uh, in Lake Erie and, and, and likewise for Lake Huron. Uh, and, and so in those cases, uh, likely more nutrients remain suspended, making their way down uh, into Lake Erie uh, uh, that may be used uh, to help establish uh, blooms later in the year. And we've also used this, these data ourselves uh, in our own studies. Uh, what you're seeing here, top panel soluble reactive phosphorus bottom panel uh, silicic acid. In water samples collected from the Ontario Municipal Water Treatment Plants, uh, their, their intake uh, program. Uh, in each panel, the shaded region shows the interquartile range of concentrations uh, for the entire period of 1999 to 2012 for the ice season. Uh, and, and separate lines show the nutrient concentrations from 2009 to 10, a normal ice year, 2010 to 2011, another you know, we call normal ice year, and then 2011 to 2012, this, this very mild winter. And during the low ice year of 2012, nutrient concentrations measured at Amherstburg, where the Detroit River flows into the lake, uh, were notable for higher concentrations of SRP and silicate during the early weeks of the historical ice season. Historical uh, SRP concentrations uh, at a central basin site, uh, Elgin, generally showed little change throughout the ice season, but substantial changes were observed uh, in 2012 with high early SRP concentrations, which returned to uh, mean levels later in the season. In contrast, silicate concentrations in the central basin tended to decrease through the winter season consistent with, with nutritional uptake by diatoms. So these, the, the, the water intakes program in Ontario uh, has been really useful, can be useful in looking back um, and provides us this, this long-term historical database uh, uh, to, to perhaps serve as a baseline uh, to help understand the effects of a changing climate. Okay, so I want to finish up uh, with just a, a little, little, some thoughts on the future. Uh, I think, uh, you know, for most of you will agree that winter science is gaining momentum. Uh, few developments, in case you're unaware, uh, through the International Joint Commission, uh, the Science Advisory Board, there is a winter science work group uh, that is forming. And that's being led by uh, my colleagues, Maggie Zanopoulos and, and Michael Twist. So uh, uh, you'll be seeing uh, more coming from that group uh, over the coming year. Uh, those of you who attended JASM in Grand Rapids will uh, may remember there was a winter science symposium on the, on the final Friday. Uh, winter science figures in the forthcoming uh, Great Lakes Decadal Science Plan. A 
work a, a group of, of of scientists interested in winter phenomena in the Great Lake has has formed. Uh, we've been meeting uh, actively uh, over the past year or so. This group initially formed out of a Sigler summit uh, that was hosted in 2019, uh, headed up by Ted Ozersky at the Large Lakes Observatory, University of Minnesota Duluth. And uh, through Ted's efforts and, and many in that group, uh, we conducted a, a winter grab uh, this past February. And I'll just talk briefly about that. And I also want to mention that we've got uh, lined up for the coming winter continued cooperation with the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, in addition to our longtime partners, the Coast Guard Cutter Nia Bay, uh, the incoming commander of, of uh, Coast Guard Cutter Morro Bay is very interested in, in starting some science operations on, on her vessel. And so we look forward to, to collaborating with both vessels uh, this coming winter. I just want to finish up, though, with this, uh, uh, just a shout out to the Winter Grab. Uh, those of you who may not be aware, uh, we had uh, uh, academic partners uh, throughout the Great Lakes Basin participate in this event uh, over a couple weeks in, in February this past year. Uh, as you can see, most of the sites are, are near shore sites, and, and that's uh, basically related to uh, accessibility, uh, uh, groups trying to venture out of the ice, either by foot or snow, snowmobile uh, uh, to collect water samples. But you will see uh, a number of the samples are, are also found open lake, and these were attributed to our partners with the uh, uh, with the combined U.S. and Canadian Coast Guards. These are just a couple of, of the sites that that I was involved monitoring Sandusky Bay on the left with uh, with my colleague George Bullerjean, and uh, uh, Mitchell's Bay on, on Lake Saint Clair uh, with some of my colleagues here from the University of Windsor. And you can see here the uh, some of the Coast Guard efforts. This actually is uh, uh, the the Canadian Coast Guard ship uh, Samuel Risley. Uh, both Risley and, 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 and CCGS uh, uh, Griffin, another Canadian Coast Guard uh, icebreaking vessel, uh, participated in the winter grab, as did Nia Bay, and they provided samples from both Lakes Huron and, and uh, Lake Erie this year. So we're looking forward to uh, taking a deeper dive into those data. And I'm going to finish off uh, with, uh, with a, a, uh, a, prom a promotion here, hot off the press, an article that we, uh, we just published in, in uh, Microbial Resource Announcements. Uh, very excited about this. It's uh, uh, reporting uh, nearly 80 uh, metatranscriptomes collected during winter and spring across spatial, temporal, and climatic gradients in Lake Erie. Uh, so these were opportunistic samples collected through our, our partnerships with the Coast Guards, um, as well as a, a, a vessel, uh, Orange Apex, that operates out of Port Stanley, Ontario. And what's really exciting about this is that these transcriptomes, as I said, span uh, climatic gradients. So include winters of, 20, of 2019, uh, which was a near maximum ice winter in Lake Erie, and, and 2020, uh, a, a, a year with negligible ice uh, in the lake. Uh, so we hope that they'll provide a unique opportunity to investigate the influence of climate change uh, on freshwater winter communities. And with that, I will... Uh, uh, stop and uh, happy to take questions and apologies for going a little bit over. No, you're fine. Um, thank you. Uh, this was great. We have gotten some really great questions during uh, Dr. McKay's presentation. So let me get started and ask him as many as we can what questions he can't answer. We'll post later on the website with his answers. Okay, so we have gotten a lot of questions dealing with the algae um, themselves. So a few of the questions that we've gotten is, could you talk a little bit more about the benefits of the algae in the lake during winter? Yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, these are uh, a, a different type of different taxa of, of algae. Uh, so uh, uh, they're, they're mainly uh, dominated by, by diatoms. Uh, diatoms in generally are, general are, are considered to be, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a good uh, source of algae. Algae in general are, are you know, base of the food chain. Uh, diatoms are lipid rich. And so these have potential uh, to, to augment nutrition uh, within, the, within the Lake Erie ecosystem. Food web implications of, of these diatoms are really unknown at present. That's one of the gaps that we need to address. Okay. Um, and we've gotten several questions dealing with um, what species of diatoms, um, they, like the specific ones, they're wondering were the highest abundance. 
that you were seeing? Well, that's a great question. You know, you know, we we we've actually seen a shift in Lake Erie uh, in in the types of diatoms that are present uh, prior to the invasion by uh, uh, dry scented mussels. We had diatom. We would have diatoms in the winter and spring, uh, but mainly things like uh, uh, fragilaria, uh, Asterionella, uh, more lightly silicified diatoms. With the invasion of the mussels and and uh, indiscriminately eating a lot of the diatoms in the lake, uh, uh, recycling nutrients, silica levels have increased in in Lake Erie since the invasion of dry scented mussels. And in response to that, we've seen we've seen uh, uh, more heavily silicified diatoms uh, become dominant. And so the ones we see most often are are, are filamentous centric diatoms like Stephanodiscus and Olicosyra. All right. Um, another question we had was, um, could you talk a little bit about um, how many years uh, this algae was present in, present in Lake Erie before becoming really visible and causing um, issues? Well, that's a, a great question. And, you know, as I pointed out, uh, we have record of some early efforts by, by David Chandler uh, in, in the late 1930s, you know, conducted actually just off of, uh, in, in, off of Stone Lab, you know, near Putin Bay. Um, evidence that we would have pulses of diatoms in the winter. The problem is, is that when we have ice cover, you can't really see these. And the only time we see them uh, is if we're breaking through the ice uh, in one of these icebreakers. And so like they're generally not visible from satellite because the, the ice cover will obscure the, 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 you know, the ability of the satellite to pick up these, these images. So I, I, I'm assuming they've always been there. Now, maybe, you know, since we've seen the, the, the uh, uh, progression from, from things like uh, Fragilaria, Asterionella to these more heavily solidified diatoms, maybe the, the, uh, the density of the, of the blooms are higher. Uh, but it's it's hard to say because again we just haven't had uh, I could say boots in the ground uh, to 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 make these observations. Sorry, um, could you talk a little bit more about um, how the mussels have increased available uh, silica? Well, it would just be through through filter filter feeding and resuspension of, of of nutrients that they ingested. Uh, now. The mussels um, are generally known to, to, to help eutrophy uh, areas of the lake. Silica, especially because it wouldn't really be an important dietary component for, for mussels. And so if, the, you know, when they're, they're uh, uh, recycling nutrients, especially if they're not using for their own growth, uh, this would be one that's probably likely in excess and would build up. And, and it's, you know, it, it's not just from Lake Erie, but also likely a lot of it's coming from Lake Huron as well. And, and that excess silica flowing down into Lake Erie. Uh, do, do the um, pigments change during the winter? Well, as we see a, as we see a, a, a progression in, in algal types, yes. You know, you'd move from the, the pigments that you would you would expect to see in, in cyanobacteria to those you'd expect to see in diatoms, which especially the secondary pigments uh, uh, would be quite different. Now, that question may also be getting at whether or not you might see higher concentrations of pigments in winter. And one of the classic adaptations of, of phytoplankton to reduce light is to increase the concentration of pigments on their thylakoid membranes. Uh, to be able to be more efficient in, in harvesting, you know, what little light there is. Uh, so when we've done some metatranscriptomic uh, analysis of the, uh, of the diatoms in winter, we've seen high expression of genes encoding uh, the light harvesting protein for fucosanthin chlorophyll AC. And this is one of the important secondary pigments of, of diatoms. So I would say yes, uh, in terms of, you know, Ice cover, expectation that you've probably got some reduced light in the water column. And as a response to that, these, these phytoplankton produce a higher concentration of pigments uh, to be able to exploit you know, the lower light intensities. All right. 
Um, another question we had was, um, would you be able to, in like a smaller reservoir system, could you treat the algae while deep in winter? Would that be possible? Uh, like when the organisms are dormant? Treat in what respect? Is uh, it, is it... I'm, ass I'm assuming to, uh, it, it doesn't say, okay. but um, they're asking like what chemical would be most effective in the colder winter. So I'm assuming to decrease the algae populations. I, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that would be an effect. If, if, if you're just concerned about, about nuisance algae in a reservoir, uh, it's not clear to me that doing any sort of a mitigation uh, uh, during the winter would be, would be helpful. Uh, you know, I, I think obviously with, with any algal growth, nuisance algal growth, if you can reduce the flow of nutrients or, re, you know, reduce the internal cycling of nutrients, uh, you're probably more, be, be more, a more effective approach. Uh, some sort of a, a targeted approach during winter, I don't think would, would be helpful. Okay. Um, we've had a, several questions dealing with um, algae and climate change. Um, uh, several people asking uh, if you're seeing a link between the reduced ice cover, warmer winters, uh, cyanobacteria blooms. Like, can you talk a little bit about what you're what you see with uh, the factor of climate change that we'll be doing with um, the algae in the winter? Uh, yeah, we had we actually had an opportunity to to address that uh, to some extent using uh, some of the work we did in, in 2012, which was a, a, a very mild winter, and comparing uh, uh, populations uh, in the previous winters, which were sort of the, the typical normal ice cover in, in, in Lake Erie. What we saw uh, very rapidly was a, a shift to smaller size plankton. So we went from, you know, in, in, a, in a normal ice cover winter, uh, we would see the, the phytoplankton dominated by, by these filamentous uh, diatoms I mentioned earlier. In 2012, we saw a, a pretty dramatic shift. Uh, so those, those large filamentous diatoms declined and we saw a lot more smaller uh, flagell you know, many flagellated uh, uh, algae. Now this, so we still had algae in the winter. Um, likely the diatoms declined because ironically, uh, light limitation, so it's hard to hard to hard to get your head around the fact that how could you have high, light limitation when there's no ice cover compared to when you have ice cover? Well, the reason there being when you when you don't have ice cover, you have wind aided mixing, and these plankton can mix through the entire water column. So they spend a portion of their day below the photic zone where light's penetrating. That can lead to light limitation. In the winter. Even though you've got ice cover that can can somehow uh, uh, diminish the light that penetrates, we find that most of these plankton are located very close to the ice surface, whether it's through convective mixing, or whether it's through physical attachment with the under ice surface, uh, which keeps them close to the close to the the surface and ensures that they receive enough light. Uh, so, light limitation will likely be an issue for plankton. Uh, during mild winters, when there's lots of wind dated mixing that continues, uh, that that might result in a shift in phytoplankton communities uh, to things that that might be smaller, um, or also things that might actually be able to be mixotrophs. In other words, they can they can gain nutrition not just by light, but also by uh, feeding on other organic compounds. All right. Um... I have one more question since we're very close to being at the end and whatever questions, there are several other questions. I will send them to Dr. McKay and he was willing to answer those questions. We'll get them onto the website uh, here in the next week or two. Um, here's the last question. Uh, are there any key similarities or differences between winter algae in Lake Erie versus some of the other large freshwater lakes? And they were asking like specifically like Lake Winnipeg. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I had an opportunity in, in, in 2013 to, to do a, uh, uh, a winter survey in Lake Winnipeg uh, by snowmobile. Uh, 
Big difference there was the ice thickness. Uh, we were encountering ice between one and two meters thick, you know, three to six feet thick. Not a lot of light penetrated uh, through the ice in, in Lake Winnipeg. So, you know, you have to go back to uh, the basic nutritional requirements of algae. Uh, they, they need light, uh, first and foremost. Wherever you can provide light and they've got enough nutrients, you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, silica to, to, to survive, temperature is not going to be a factor. You'll find some form, some form of organism that will, will, will be responsive and, 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 and uh, uh, grow well under those conditions. Problem Lake Winnipeg was the, was the ice thickness. Now, as you progress into the spring in a place like Winnipeg, Lake Winnipeg, and that ice starts melting, you would then have conditions where you would start seeing more light penetrating. We see that condition in the Arctic with, as, as ice recedes in the Arctic, we get thinning and we're starting to see blooms, very similar blooms in the Arctic of these, of these uh, centric diatoms. We see the same thing in some of the Russian Great Lakes, uh, Lake Baikal, for example, uh, in Siberia, and uh, uh, Lake Onega, uh, uh, closer to uh, north of St. Petersburg, blooms, but not until later in the spring as the ice thins and we start getting penetration. So I'd say, yes, this can be a, a, a relatively common phenomenon in large lakes, especially large lakes where you have, like Lake Erie, where you have a, a long fetch, predominantly western winds that can blow snow. And so you have large patches of ice, which are snow free. And that provides conditions that will, will allow enough light penetration through the ice for these plankton to grow. All right, well, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I will bring the closing to this webinar. This was so great. And we've got so many great questions that I'll be sending you here shortly, Dr. McKay. I look forward to it. <laughs> thank you again for your willingness to talk to us today about your research. This was really a great presentation and really an excellent discussion. Um, I'd also like to thank Christina Dierkes for her work organizing this webinar. Um, I would like to also remind everyone that our survey URL is in uh, for this webinar is in the chat feature. So if you could take a few minutes to fill that out. Uh, this webinar uh, series is sponsored by Ohio Sea Grant and will continue next month with Dr. Justin Chapin, who will be talking about algal bloom toxin forecast research. The registration link is in the chat. Thank you again, Dr. McKay. Always a great pleasure to hear you talk about your winter algae. So we really appreciate that. And thank you all uh, participants for on this webinar. We hope that this was beneficial and we hope that you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you again, Dr. McKay. Thanks, Jill and Christina. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.